Good afternoon. I'm happy to welcome everyone to the launch of the first ever European Myeloma Day. I'm Katie Joyner, the Chief Operating Officer at MP, and I will moderate today's event. Um, we have an exciting agenda for today, but before I hand it over to our president for the official kickoff, we just have a few housekeeping items. This event will be recorded, so if you wish to stay anonymous, please feel free to switch off your camera or change your name on the Zoom ID. Um, throughout the event, please keep your microphone on mute um, to ensure there are no dis uh, disturbances or disruptions. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the event. Please put all of your questions in the chat box and specify who the question is for, and one of the MP staff will help facilitate um, the Q&A at the end of the event. And if you have any technical difficulties today, please use the raised hand function um, at the bottom of the Zoom, and we will assist you. Now I'll hand it over to our president, Lisa Lott Erickson, to officially kick off the day. Lisa Lott. Uh, Lisa Lott, you're muted. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Lott Eriksson, as Katie said, the president for MPE. And it is with so much joy and pleasure I welcome you all to this uh, to launch this first ever European Myeloma Day. I'm really so excited to see all representatives from over 30 countries across Europe and uh, across all our stakeholders to come together to one voice for the uh, myeloma community. Uh, and it has been a goal for us to create a platform to actually raise awareness for myeloma and to highlight all the challenges uh, that are faced to European patients all over Europe. Uh, and to identify solutions and also improve lives for the myeloma patients. So the launch of European Myeloma Day is a significant milestone for MPE that we are so proud of. So it's with pride and honor that I really happy to officially launch this first ever Myeloma, European Myeloma Day. And the theme for 2022 has been early diagnosis all throughout the year. So, and we have conducted uh, activities to understand and explore and challenges, the challenges that face for patients and doctors or over Europe uh, to obtaining a timely diagnosis. Uh, so today, as Katie mentioned, we will be hearing from patients and doctors, challenges and experience and findings from the research that we actually have been doing throughout the year. Uh, and to talk about steps to improve the early diagnosis. Uh, and uh, once again, I want to thank all of you for being here today and to spending the afternoon with us. And without support and involvement from the patient community, MPE, uh, staff members, advocates, healthcare professionals, industry, and other partners, it wouldn't have been possible to do this day today. So uh, I want to extend a special thanks also to all the patients that have so generously shared all their experience with us. Uh, so we have been able to do the research and together we can actually improve diagnosis and finally improve lives for the myeloma patients. So that is very important. So with that, thanks again. And now I want to hand over to Katie again. Thanks so much, Lisa Lott. 
Um, so our first speaker today will be Severine Wollenschneider. Um, Severine is a multiple myeloma patient and a patient advocate from France, and she will share her diagnosis experience and story with us today. Just a quick reminder to keep your microphones on mute and please leave your questions in the chat. Severine. Thank you, Katie, for, for this nice presentation. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so very briefly, it's really a real pleasure to share my story today with you. And um, I am a, a 58 year old person and very happy pre-retired person since few months only, but it's really uh, nice. I've been working in um, drug development for quite a long time, and uh, I'm a, a multiple myeloma patient currently on complete remission. And uh, I'm unfortunately re relapsed two years after uh, the stem uh, cell transplant, but now everything is good. I do have a lot of hobbies, despite the fact that I'm also busy with MP and other engagement, but um, I'm, I do like painting, sewing, hiking, biking, and most of all, looking after my uh, six grandchildren. So that's really great. Next slide, please. So I will very briefly share my experience. So what was my first symptoms and the first period of the fact that I was becoming a patient, if I may say like that, and truly, for these uh, five months, my lead motive was I need to rest. So I was not really very on alert uh, from any disease, nothing, because so far I was not um, sick at any point of time. So for me, it was also a new, a new pass. I was having a very high pressure from work, intensive workload, and I was traveling a lot. So for me, it was something quite normal that I was suffering time to time to my, from my back, and I was really tired. I was a bit slow in the morning. This was coming more and more frequent, but that said, nothing really very serious. At least I saw that. The, the real first alert was uh, after 10 minutes um, of work, after lunch, I was not able to go further. And I asked everyone that was uh, with me to come back at, at my place because I was really tired. Other than that, it was okay. And then I had a, a very long break for, for Christmas. I am from France, so I always take long holidays. So that's the point. And I was really feeling better, not fully recharged, but still very, um, very much uh, in, in good spirit, at least. However, the back pain was coming more and more frequently. And the first serious, what I am calling serious alert was really few days after I start again work, working, I was feeling very tired. And then I thought there is something wrong. And I started my, um, my journey with and going to, to the, the GP. The point was also I was, um, feeling my back more and more frequently. I was not able really to stay in a sitting position nor in a standard position. So it was really becoming more and more serious, if I may say like that. Next slide, please. And then I started what I call the marathon of visit because literally it was uh, over the, the next five months, it was really a marathon in terms of um, medical visit. And I include everything here, but I had to go in five months um, five times to my GP. I had three medical appointments with an oncologist. I had appointment also with a specialist. I had multiple visits with a radiologist and for blood sampling. And this is also something that I will uh, share afterwards uh, at the end of this presentation, the, the, um, the feeling of why we need to go so frequently to a, to a GP or to a, a, um, a radiologist and so on. And it was uh, always the, the fact that I had to repeat the same story again and again and wait very long hours in a waiting room. The medical journey for me was uh, my back pain that was becoming stronger and stronger every day. Concretely, I was not able, able to work anymore, almost, uh, nor to sit. And I, 
I needed up to 90 minutes to get off my bed on certain morning, just to give you uh, the, the feeling and the, the, the sense of how I was suffering. And I was not able neither to carry more than one or two kilos, which is a pack of, sh of sugar, for instance. So it's really nothing. I was more and more tired and I lost appetite. So the, thank you. And then came this famous day of the diagnostic day. And uh, I just need to give you the context of that day. Um, at least in France is how it's working. So I did receive at home the MRI result. And at the end, in the conclusion, it was a sentence saying few tumors along the spinal column that could look like bone metastasis. It should be confirmed by further investigation. I can tell you when you are receiving this result in front of you, you are thinking there is something wrong and it's really serious. And as I was also working in a, in a medical environment, I knew that it was really, really serious. The only thing that was a bit balancing that was that the standard cancer marker were all negative on my uh, last uh, blood sampling. However, it was a very high level of monoclonal antibody, uh, antibody type IgG um, with a light chain kappa. Then, so it was a context. And then I, I did arrive to my GP and I gave him the report of everything. And he I was sitting in front of him. And then literally I was, I was seeing him becoming pale and speech, speechless. And when you see someone like that, you are thinking, okay, oh, it's even more serious than this probably I thought. And, uh, and honestly, I asked him to share the bad news. And I, I still can uh, hear me uh, or myself saying, please give me the bad news because I knew it was bad. So after this uh, seven months, all this medical visit, long hours spending in a, in a waiting room, I was um, knowing why I was suffering a deep fat fatigue and heavy um, back pain. And honestly, I felt relieved, which is perhaps weird, but it is how I was feeling at this day. And then the journey continued on the following days. And um, it was also a new MRI, new imaging, new blood sampling and biopsies also. Um, in, in, um, in two months almost, I had to go for three new bio biopsies, one PET scan, multiple um, um, medical appointment and so on. And, I saw for the first time in June, so you remember, we started the previous August, and now we are in June, so almost a year after, I saw an hematologist. And the first treatment was towards end of July. I honestly do not remember exactly when it was. I, I know it was toward um, end of July. I was facing also some family challenge, but nevertheless, it it took really afterward a long time between the diagnostic uh, diagnosis day and the first uh, treatment. Can you go to the next slide, please? And here my, um, my thinking, my lesson and learn, if I may say like that, that are split in two big, big topics. The first one is what I can summarize with the medical world is hard to understand and it's very difficult to liaise with them. Um, the, the first thing I'm, I'm thinking, and I already share that with some GPs and, uh, and, and doctors, unfortunately, the, the medical people are not trained enough to diagnose or think about rare disease and are not considering enough fatigue and pain. I can understand that because most of the people are suffering of something and are uh, feeling some, uh, some uh, fatigue. However, they must pay much more attention from my perspective. And it was one of my, my challenge, at least at the beginning. The other point is I saw a lot of different people, a lot of different uh, medical uh, person. And it was that they were asking me to go for a biopsy even though it was a few days apart, or to go for a scan or to go for an MRI. And I was telling them, yes, but you have the result. It's only 
few days old. So why I sh should go for another one? So, and it was really very difficult to, to make them understand that no need of redoing things again and again. And then some also sentences that I, I was uh, hearing uh, during the, um, the the medical appointment. And the first one was really a shock. It was um, the one that I, I was hearing during the first uh, uh, appointment with uh, an oncologist. So it was after the GP, I went to an oncologist. And then what he was telling me was literally, multiple myeloma is incurable. However, you are lucky because there are plenty of new treatments under development available in second line and beyond. I was not 50 year old at this time. You are, you, the, the day before you learned that you are suffering about a very serious disease. And you, you do have, and it was really resonating in my mind, incurable, available, second line and beyond. So for me, it was the end of the world. I would say, even though I was a bit um, relieved, it was nevertheless very difficult to, to really uh, accept this sentence. Then I, I got some sentences. Um, you cannot be included in clinical trial as you work in a pharma company. It was like that, door closed. And, um, and then um, it was, um, I was really asking why I should wait so long between the, the diagnosis piece and announcement and the first treatment. And the only, um, the only response I got was, we want to be sure before initiating the treatment. And I was thinking, yes, okay, I can understand that. You do not want to, to be wrong in, some, in implementing something. However, look at me. I mean, it's not a joke. Take me seriously. I need to, to really uh, get something to, to um, uh, go down with my pain and, and, and cure. My bone was, was de destroying in very quickly. So I wanted to, to really start that, but it took uh, three months before. So that was also something uh, very difficult for me to, uh, to handle and, and accept actually. My personal takeaway from all this journey is I see life differently, definitively. I acknowledge uh, every positive moment and I can tell you, I celebrate all of them because there is no point that I continue my life as I did previously. So for me, um, the, this is really something uh, very important. Um, I also now took the decision that I go to my GP almost immediately when so meaning that even though there is um, something not very serious as a cold or something i go to <laughs> to my gp because it's it's a big learning i do not want to wait and say okay severin you need a, a rest because you are tired about because of workload or whatever and last but not least the family environment is really a key success factor and i would like um, particularly to to give a big thank you to my husband because without him i would not have been able to go through this journey through this path i would say so smoothly if i may say like that and um, and it's it's really very important and i must admit that i'm very lucky with this so now you know how was my journey. Thank you for listening to me and waiting for some question if you have at the end of this, all, all the presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Severine, for sharing your story and especially for sharing some of the learnings um, and kind of takeaways that we can have from your experience um, with your diagnosis. Um, our next speaker um, I'd like to introduce is Luke Albrecht, um, a, a multiple myeloma patient from Belgium who will share more about his diagnosis story as well as his treatment experience. Luke? Luke, you're on mute. Okay, should be in. Okay, sorry. 
So good day to you all. Uh, my name is Luke Albrecht. I'm from Belgium, 58 years old, and uh, since five years, I'm a, a myeloma patient. Married, one daughter. After high school, I uh, attended the Antwerp Maritime Academy, and then I uh, served 12 years in the Merchant Marine. So I went to sea, of which three years as a captain. In 1997, I uh, switched to a ma more landlocked job as a pilot, a river pilot, I bringing the ships on the river scale to the port of Antwerp. Beyond that, I twice a month, I train junior colleagues on the simulator. In my free time, I uh, usually swim even longer distances in open water. I read and travel. My or I should say our myeloma story starts in 2013, the 1st of May, when my wife broke her one of her vertebras and uh, we went to our doctor, but he wouldn't believe us. And a myeloma stayed hidden from even through an extensive RX3 physiotherapist and ongoing treatment from our doctor for about five months. And then the radiologist set the right diagnosis. She had the myeloma, IgG, kappa, no aggressive factors. She shrank 12 centimeters and 14 vertebrae were stabilized with keto and vertebroplasty. She had a complete treatment with Velcade and was in remission for five years. In that time, she resumed work teaching in high school. After that, she relapsed only once. She had VTD again, an autologous stem cell transplant. And after that, until present, she's on Rivlimit, but she never returned to school again. Of course, our daughter, which is now following this uh, session as well from Athens, uh, has herself tested yearly. Although myeloma is not genetic, but she lives with the knowledge of her parents and as well with the fear. My story, and you can follow it now on the slides presented. I was diagnosed in November 2017 when my wife was in remission. Though the first symptom, a broken rib, occurred in June that year. Again, our doctor didn't believe us didn't believe me and maybe partly because I was very fit at that time I trained a lot in swimming after that broken rib the whole summer there was a growing fatigue that I experienced and I couldn't place it in September the fatigue continued I felt constantly ill humored and was even aggressive to other people and I remember that I couldn't even take my bike out of a stand to hold my bike for myself. By October, my back starts to hurt and our doctor wanted to send me to a physiotherapist, but I refused having the experience with my wife. I started Pilates to strengthen my back muscles, but hardly any changing. The pain and the uncomfortable moving and walking were ever increasing. And at a certain point in that October, I had to stop every activity. I could hardly walk. Walk. And finally, in November, an MRA on the backbone is shown the damage. And then, after insisting, the doctor took a blood sample for a specific test on my myeloma. By the end of November 2017, I was diagnosed myeloma IgA light chain lambda with a few typical chromosome failures, a rather on favorable condition <clears throat> if our doctor would have known anything about myeloma and actually he had two elderly patients i learned later on and he was more conscious enough to think of it as a possibility both in case of my wife and myself major damage to our bone structure could have been prevented and even i think as a rare disease even in in every uncertain diagnose, a test for myeloma could be done. 
this, di this disease is too much life-changing or even life-devastating to ignore it. Why we shouldn't incorporate a specific test for myeloma, for instance, whenever a 50-plus person has a blood test at, at random for a casual checkup, and mainly a proper knowledge and awareness of the first-line doctors would save precious time for us. I shrank seven centimeters, and during my first week of the Velcade treatment, seven vertebrae were stabilized to vertebroplasty. I could hardly stand on my feet, let alone walk. By the end of December 2017, a month after diagnosed, I used a walker in the house to move. And slowly onwards, I walked up and down the street and then a block, still using my walk. I was mentally broken, remembering being fit and almost an amateur athlete just before that. After Christmas, I could walk without help. And in January, I started swimming slowly 10 meters then up to 20 meters. The hard thing was getting into the pool. It was a hard time, even during these chemo sessions, striving for independent mobility and fitness against all odds. In the beginning, I thought then to redirect my job to a more administrative function, but I couldn't. It was wishful thinking. It was another mental shock, starting to realize that I probably wouldn't be able to work for your for a year, if ever at all. It felt like if someone has cut the world from under your feet, your whole personality and concept of life changes dramatically. The concept of time in your life is totally disrupted. Your body is even a stranger to yourself. But I worked hard on improving my movements and strength, walking, swimming. And in February, I took up the simulator training again as a new motivation to go on. Can we have the, new, the next slide, please? In March that year, 2018, I was prepared for the autologous stem cell transplant, first by high dose of endoxan, going into quarantine with a high dose of melphalan, and then on the 13th of March, 2018, I got my stem cells back. The worst thing during this period was the dehumanization of my body and my life. And being utterly sick, it is very hard to imagine that you will be alive again, ever. I recovered rather quickly, picked up swimming again, and by September, I was piloting ships again. I start living once more. And after the diagnosis and the first treatment, as well for my wife as myself, we were focusing to get better in order to resume our work. Next slide, please. I was in remission for about a year, and since then I relapsed twice, biomedical as well as clinical. After the first relapse, I got Dazalex, this daratuzumab, the rivalumid, and the dexamethasone. This treatment did not work very well, and after six months, we stopped the treatment. After the second uh, relapse, now the last line I have, I've been treated with Kiprolis, Endoxan, and Dexa for about a year and a half, of which last six months, I got only the Kiprolis and the Dexamethasone every two weeks. When we started up the Kiprolis, the plan was to prepare for stem cell transplant with donor cells. And fortunately, the donor cells of my brother were uh, a good match. But when the stem cell transplant was at hand, all cancer parameters were undetectable. I felt really good. I was feeling very strong and I refused last year the transplant. And we got on with the Kiprolis and Dexamethasone, which gave me another good year. So this last year, my wife and I traveled a lot, for instance, a round trip to South Africa. I did my swim holidays. I swam even the Bosporus and I continue normal working schedules. And my hematologist agreed every now and then to defer from the infusion schedule just to give me time to work or to travel, actually to live. We lived our lives 
but always with the infusions, with the side effects that needed attention from our other doctors or another specialist. It's a never ending story that costs a lot of energy. It's a story of the ball and chain you, uh, I mentioned in the slides. And you never get rid of, even in your best moments. And eventually, I'm growing tired of all those major and minor defects. Next slide, please. So, at present, my AGA is on the rise again. And what will be next in the coming months and for how long is not sure yet. I question myself regularly, how many years do I have left and how many good years? One more remark in the process to the allergen stem cell transplant. The transplant doctor advised me to prepare my last will and arrange other things for my last phase of life. So I did with the notary public. I signed the euthanasia papers with my present family doctor. I booked a nurse and a network to take care of me in my last days, which I preferred to finish at home. This was a very difficult mental process, not only for me, but also for my wife and my daughter. But in the same time, it was, and still is a great relief to have all these matters arranged for me and my family. Henceforth, I'm very lucky and grateful to my hematologist, Dr. Natalie Putt and her colleagues, of the hospital in Genk. She's very open for any concern, doubts or discussions from my side, and she makes every effort to consult other specialists or other research institutions, universities, if more information is required to make a decision whatsoever concerning another next treatment. Thank you for your attention. Any question uh, will be answered today. Thank you so much, Luke and Severine, for being here and being so open and honest about your experiences and sharing your insights um, and, uh, you know, the feelings and the um, the real challenges that you faced in getting a diagnosis and then managing your treatment and your symptoms. We really appreciate you um, sharing your stories with our audience here today. Um, and now we are going to turn over to two um, hematologists who will speak about their experience in diagnosing uh, multiple myeloma patients. Our first speaker is Dr. Charlotte Pollan, the hemato a hematology consultant at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. Dr. Pollan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to um, help launch this exciting um, day. You go to my next slide, please. I have a slide here about the challenges of myeloma patients getting to a myeloma diagnosis, but I'm not sure that any of it can be in any way as eloquent or as great an example of what we hear from patients as the two testimonies we've both heard. So both Severine and Luke have really summarized a lot of what a lot of patients that I see in clinic also tell me. And that's something that we as clinicians want to try really hard to try and help fix. So, sorry, I've got animations in my slides, which is difficult when someone else is managing them. So could you just open the whole slide maybe um, at once? So this was really just to try and summarize a lot of what um, Severine and Luke have shared with us that, a lot of patients or all patients experiences start in the community at home, they may experience symptoms. There is, you know, a time at which they will consult their local doctor, we call them GPs in the UK. And as you have heard from the, the, the testimonies we've, we've, we've listened to, a lot of times that doesn't lead to a quick diagnosis for patients. And I think that's really something that we want to try and address. And a lot of patients will end up going back and forth between the community and uh, maybe their local hospital um, before reaching that diagnosis, as we've heard. And we know that most patients on average are likely to present about three times before they end up being um, referred even on from their community doctor into a hospital or a hematology centre. And meaning that the diagnosis then takes several months to be to be reached. And, and as we've heard from Severine, perhaps even longer before they will start treatment. And around a third of patients are even still diagnosed in an emergency setting. So having gone into an accident in an emergency department rather than even through a kind of outpatient system of referral. 
And so all of these pathways to diagnosis are really complicated for patients and they will often then be, be left with this feeling of, of, of not being heard, of not having their symptoms listened to or not being investigated as quickly as we would um, in retrospect have wanted that to have happened. Uh, could you go to my next slide, please? And so why does it take so long for myeloma patients to be delayed, to, to be diagnosed? Well, we know that myelo the myeloma plasma cell in the bone marrow leads to the symptoms like anemia, kidney damage, bone damage that we've heard um, Severine's and Luke's experience of. And I guess the challenge um, for general practitioners or even other specialists within hospitals to diagnose myeloma is that these are really very common symptoms and they're very non-specific. So they don't always mean myeloma. And a lot of GPs will potentially only see one or two or perhaps more in the case of um, Luke's um, experience. But it's, it's challenging to, to make sure that we have myeloma as a uh, near the top of the list of things that people are thinking of when they see patients with some of these symptoms. Myeloma is itself very rare. If you could go to my next slide, please. And so what does that mean for patients? Well, from the doctor side of things, it means that by the time, or sorry, from a hematologist point of view, it means that by the time we see patients in clinic, patients will have more symptoms than they would have done if we had seen them earlier. They are, their quality of life will have been more affected by those symptoms, as we've heard. And they may well be suffering from more pain, more bone damage, and things that are really going to affect um, patients' ability to carry on with their normal work and home life. There are other things that go alongside that. So financial concerns that come along with having to have stopped work and still potentially being uncertain what is, um, what is happening to them. And then for me, one of the things that's really critical is that through all of this process of perhaps going to see several different um, doctors, both in the community and maybe in hospitals too, there's a loss of trust in um, medical care and how that medical care is going to be then able to take forward um, treatment for the disease. And so we need to try and address all of these things to try and maintain that, um, that trust and enable patients to then um, feel confident that their disease will be treated um, going forwards. Uh, next slide, please. And so how do the delays affect what we as doctors as hematologists can, can do for patients? Well, there is an effect in how we can deliver treatment sometimes. So if a patient's diagnosis is delayed, then we can see that patients might be increasingly frail and that can affect um, the types of treatment or the doses of treatment that we can use to treat myeloma. We've heard about the bone damage and uh, accumulation of kind of new symptoms and pains that patients may go through, but some specifically, for example, damage to um, kidneys from myeloma can affect how we deliver treatment when we are at that point of starting treatment for patients in the myeloma clinic. Next slide. And so for me, how do we go about trying to improve all of that? So we, and this is really supposed to kind of um, in a picture summarize the fact that I think as hematologists, we need to kind of reach out and encompass um, clinicians in the community and other clinicians within the hospital, as well as other people in the community and through efforts um, that like those that Myeloma Patients Europe are putting lots of effort into trying to um, increase education, increase training and increase awareness of myeloma. But I think we also have to be aware that it remains a rare disease and however much we try to do that, we need to perhaps think more broadly about whether there are other approaches we can take to try and take out some of the reliance on an individual person that a patient may see in a clinic. So are there ways we can use um, data putting together results of scans and blood tests in a more coherent way rather than things being very separated? Or as I think Luke mentioned, what can we think about ways that we can start to to screen patients. And that's something that's being studied in a couple of ongoing studies. And we don't yet know whether that's um, likely to, to help improve things, but these are really things that we're kind of trying to push forward to try and make sure that we're encompassing all of this when we think about addressing um, delayed diagnosis and trying to make sure that patients receive this life-changing diagnosis as early as possible to enable us to deliver the best treatment that we can. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Pollan, for sharing your thoughts and insights today, as well as some of the recommendations. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Oliver Karen Filski from the University Clinic of Hematology in Skopje, uh, North Macedonia. Dr. Karen Filski. Good afternoon to all of you, and I'm glad to be here if anything of what I say would help further manage these patients and uh, bring some joy to their life as it is, because we have heard these stories that uh, a lot of problems surround the diagnosis and the patients. So what I'm uh, supposed to talk about is why a timely diagnosis really matters in this situation. The main problem with the diagnosing multiple myeloma is that its manifestations are not specific. You heard the problems that the patients had. They do quite have similarities, but also have some differences. So the main manifestation of uh, myeloma by which it could be thought of as a serious disease is the anemia. But the problem with the anemia is that it's normocytic and normochromic, which means the size of the erythrocytes of the red blood cells does not change and the color does not change. So this is initially suggestive maybe of blood loss or destruction of blood, which is called hemolysis. This inevitably leads to the main problem with all the patients with myeloma, that is fatigue, weakness, inability to perform as before. So this is not something that when you find a patient with anemia of like 95 grams, you would say, aha, uh -huh, this is myeloma. And this is a problem. Next, there is the bone pain and the bone problems. And everybody that first comes in contact with this kind of a patient would say, is it rheumatic if the age fits? Is it something that you have done in your sleep or while you are working or you hit somewhere, you hit yourself somewhere where you don't know? If it's a lady or an older person, maybe osteoporosis would be the first guess. And then maybe you broke your arm or leg or something and you don't even know it, but that's what hurts. So this is also something that doesn't say you have myeloma, you have a problem with your bones, but this is still not indicative of only myeloma. Renal insufficiency is something that occurs in myeloma quite often, but then it is a separate disease. It can be acute, it can be chronic, it can lead to dialysis. So someone would think that this is a renal disease. And then there is the thing with the hypercalcemia, which needs urgent addressing and correction, and that can be done, but that still does not prove whether there is a super renal problem or whether it's myeloma or everything. And then there is weight loss. There is a need, uh, there is a problem with the uh, cognitive functions, with uh, communication with people, with uh, following activities and everything. And this is all not specific. So these things can occur in a wide variety of diseases and it doesn't say this is myeloma. So what can we do? Let's go to the other slide. First of all, everybody that was saying something about myeloma is that we need to think of multiple myeloma as one of the options for these problems that arise in, in our patients. Uh, we do education for the general practitioners and the family physicians on that level so that they should think about it. It's not really their duty to know all the problems that arise in myeloma, but they should know that it is one of the possibilities and pay attention to the science and the findings that can direct this patient to a proper uh, specialist. Uh, in this sense, my opinion is that uh, the GPs and the family physicians need to have uh, availability to do a serum protein electrophoresis testing at every patient that they suspect that could be affected by multiple myeloma. Because this is a very basic analysis in, in biochemistry and it could 
direct the opinion towards myeloma because there are not as many diseases that have high levels of serum proteins, especially high levels of gamma globulin fra uh, fraction of the, of the protein level. If you have problems with the bones, your general physician should have some x-ray investigations. But the thing is, these, uh, the diagnosis of myeloma uh, requests that you have the flat bones uh, uh, screened, and that is the head, that is the pelvic bones, and that is the vertebral column. And this is something you wouldn't do if a patient says that, you, that, that he or she has pain in the arm or the leg, maybe the leg would require the, the vertebral column, but not everything. And then if we have a reasonable doubt, this is a very much a legal term, but if the doctor has reasonable doubt that maybe myeloma is what this patient has, a prompt referral to a hematologist. I know that oncologists do hematology in many, many countries and centers, but this is still something that we have as a specific, one of our specific uh, uh, diseases. And the prompt referral to a hematologist would speed up the process and come to the point of treatment. Can I have the next, next slide, please? So what happens if the diagnosis is not set in, in due time? All of the parameters that I mentioned on slide one will worsen. They will not regress. They do not spontaneously regress. They will just go into further phase. Possible bone fractures, which we call pathology because they occur under a very small stimulus. It's not the proper reason for having a fracture. In this kind of a patient, it will occur. So it will further incapacitate the patient and if the fracture is in a very specific place in the, in the vertebral column, it could also lead to plegic uh, problems. Life-threatening hypercalcemia should be taken care of immediately, and that does not require the, the diagnosis of myeloma. It should be taken care of regardless of the reason. Then the hypervisco-viscosity, which is a problem uh, dependent on the protein level, will deter the cognitive, the intellectual uh, functions, and even the behavior towards other, towards, toward other people. And that will maybe even suggest a neurological disorder, which more complicates the, the diagnosis. Anemia will progress, which will maybe require even transfusions. And other lowering of the level of white blood counts, white blood cells and uh, platelets, would even bring the patient to a, uh, to a position where chemotherapy, which is essential for treating myeloma, is not going to be able to be delivered to the patient, or maybe it will carry a, a bigger risk because a further administration of chemotherapy could even worsen these, these findings. And then if we let the myeloma go on, there is the possibility that it will not respond to what we call standard first line initial treatment, and that we will need to do something that is more aggressive. And the last slide, I think, summarizes just about everything I have said. So whatever we do in the chain of health uh, system is the one reason, managing why or finding a way how to manage this patient by the so-called correct specialist. It will bring uh, the possibility of avoiding long-term dialysis as a nephrological uh, disease uh, also to us, to the patient. It will bring, it will reach avoiding long-term treatment for osteoporosis without any improvement, arthritis or rheumatic disease also without any improvement. Cytopenias, which will be devastating for uh, initial treatment would be prevented. We would reach, when we have the diagnosis, a proper management and treatment plan, which is something a doctor does in the beginning. We will give 
bis bisphosphonates, which will prevent, they will not revert, but they will prevent further bone destruction. So the patient will maintain mobility and a very good overall condition will be possible to do whatever he or she was doing until then, which means we will be enabling self-support rather than third-party support. If the stage does not progress, if we give initial therapy in the first uh, possibility, then we'll minimize the risk of stage progression. So we need to choose the first line treatment. If the risk is standard, then the initial treatment is standard. Serious incapaci incapacitating complications, which we heard of from the patients mainly will be. Uh, minimized, as will be the consequences of these complications. And not to be only uh, addressing patients' needs, uh, the health system is going to minimize expenses because the earlier we, di we diagnose the multiple myeloma, the standard therapy and uh, procedures will be uh, performed, and this will not take a huge chunk of uh, the health system, what happens if we need to uh, administer second and third, third line therapy. Also, if the patient is not incapacitated, he, will, he or she will not need to stay in hospital for treatment, but rather do this over the, uh, within the daycare units. So conditionally, because we're still talking about a malignant disease, it will enable so a relatively normal living. There is the psychological moment, moment, which is knowing that you're living with a malignant disease, but it is somewhat a modern day magic that you can actually live with a malignant disease quite normally. If you're diagnosed on time and you're giving treatment, which does help also on time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pollan and Dr. Karen Filsky for taking the time to present your experiences and observations with us and for all of the work that you do to help myeloma patients um, in your countries. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please put your questions um, in the chat box. And um, I'm excited to welcome our next guest, our colleague, Celine Tenseldom, Research Assistant at MPE, who will be presenting um, the findings from MPE's early diagnosis research. Celine? Thank you, Katie. Um, yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to present to you the findings uh, of, the MP, uh, of the project MP conducted on the diagnosis of experiences of uh, European myeloma patients um, and the perspectives of European hematologists. Next slide. So early diagnosis of myeloma has been shown to minimize disease complications and improve quality of life. Um, however, the existing literature on myeloma highlights that patients experience delays often due to nonspecific symptoms, uh, lack of myeloma awareness in primary care or other causes. Um, and therefore to further explore these issues, MP conducted a pan-European uh, study to capture patient diagnostic experiences, um, as well as the perspective from clinicians um, and gain also the uh, understand the impact of a later diagnosis and solutions on how we can improve diagnosis. Um, so this project was split into two phases, the first being a survey and the second being focus groups and interviews. Uh, and the survey and focus group questions were designed by MPE and informed by non-systematic literature review. Uh, and the questions related to uh, barriers to seeking medical help, diagnosis timing, impact of a late diagnosis, and solutions on how to improve diagnosis. So as you can see in the table um, uh, on the screen, uh, in total, 628 patients and 80 hematologists uh, completed the survey, and 23 patients and six hematologists took part in the focus groups and interviews. Next slide, please. 
So to start off, um, looking at barriers to seeking medical help, uh, our survey found that approximately 51% of patients waited more than th uh, three or more months after onset of symptoms before seeking medical help. Um, and the focus groups highlighted that nonspecific sy symptoms, GP, so general practic practitioner shortages, um, and health system related factors, such as getting appointments between private and public insured patients, uh, were some of the main reasons that held uh, that patients, main reasons for patients um, not seeking medic medical help in the first place. Next slide, please. So moving on to the initial presentation of symptoms, our survey found that most patients, um, 63%, first presented with their symptoms or received abnormal blood results at their GP. 14% um, 40, of patients completed, completing the survey presented at a secondary uh, care department. So for example, hematology department or oncology department. However, 11% of patients first presented with their symptoms at an emergency hospital department. Next slide, please. Um, and looking at diagnosis timing, our survey found that many patients were diagnosed within a month of consulting a healthcare professional. However, 24% um, of patients waited five months or more to get a diagnosis. And hematologists were slightly more optimistic um, uh, than patients stating that 45% uh, that it took 45% uh, of patients less than a month to get diagnosed and 13% stating it takes five months or more. Next slide, please. We also asked patients and clinicians how many specialists um, patients see before being diagnosed and how many medical consultations patients have in total before uh, diagnosis. And the results showed that um, although most patients saw up to three different specialists, such as in primary care or in a renal department or ortho orthopedic department, 21% of patients saw four specialists or more before receiving a diagnosis. Um, and 14% of uh, hematologists stated their patients saw more than three specialists. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the number of consultations, 45% of patients stated they had more than three medical consultations and 22% had more than six. Um, and 38% of hematologists reported that their patients typically had three medical consultations and 31% stated they had four or more. So um, the experience the views between patients and clinicians were fairly in line across uh, the research. Next slide, please. Our research also found that um, although many patients believe that they had a timely diagnosis, approximately 34% of patients stated that, that their diagnosis was delayed. And similarly, 25% of clinicians described the uh, timing of diagnosis in their country as delayed. Um, and to understand, to interpret the survey results, patients and uh, hematologists were asked about um, how they might define a delayed diagnosis in the focus groups. Um, and most patients and hematologists agreed that a delayed diagnosis refers to the severity of symptoms and complications patients present with at diagnosis. So it is not about setting an arbitrary time point on a delay, um, but they also agree that the misidentification of myeloma symptoms, the repeat presentation in primary care, um, and the referral to, to wrong hospital depar departments all negatively um, impact on patient experiences and psychosocial well-being. And um, this should be considered as part of the definition of a delayed diagnosis. Next slide, please. Um, so our research, uh, we also um, looked at, uh, asked in the focus groups about barriers to timely diagnosis. And our research found seven core themes from patients and hematologists um, contributing to delayed diagnosis in myeloma, which are listed on, on the slide. 
Um, and in the survey, hematologists were specifically asked what they consider are the biggest barriers. And results found that non-specific, um, the non-specificity -specific of symptoms, um, the overlapping with common signs of frailty and aging, uh, the lack of uh, GP awareness of myeloma were some of the main reasons um, uh, perceived behind the diagnosis delay amongst hematologists. However, COVID-19 um, health system and access issues were also um, uh, cited as bi barriers to timely diagnosis, um, including disjointed healthcare systems, lack of coordinated care, and a lack of access to diagnostic tests and investigations. Next slide, please. Um, so through this research, we also want to find out what the impact of a delayed diagnosis has on patients. Uh, and the survey and focus groups highlighted six core themes. Um, we found that patients and hematologists agreed that the impact of a delayed diagnosis can have significant long-term symptoms and complica complications. Um, and the impact of these complications may also affect treatment options and survival. 78% um, of patients believed their diagnosis had a significant impact on their quality of life, affecting their ability to undertake uh, daily activities. And many patients' um, emotional well being were also impacted. However, we also, uh, the survey also highlighted the impact on uh, carers and family members with 45% of patients who experienced a delayed diagnosis stating their delayed diagnosis had a significant impact on uh, their family's well-being. Um, and other aspects such as finances were also uh, highlighted as a key uh, topic in the focus groups. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, although many uh, patients experience a timely diagnosis, uh, in our research, 34% of patients experienced a delayed diagnosis. And we highlighted that diagnosing a rare disease with nonspecific symptoms is challenging. Um, and many barriers are faced uh, when diagnosing myeloma, such as disparities in access to testing, the availability of GP appointments, and uh, overburdened and under-resourced healthcare systems. However, uh, we also highlighted that the impact of a delayed diagnosis can have, um, uh, is, it can be detrimental uh, for a patient's um, emotional well-being. Um, we also found that not only can symptoms complicate, symptom complications possibly have an impact on treatment options and responses. Um, it can also have an impact on physical fitness, and it can also extend beyond the patient to affect family uh, members and financial stability, um, whereas a timely diagnosis can significantly improve a patient's quality of life. Um, so thank you for listening uh, to my presentation. And in the second part of this um, event, my colleague will discuss some of the recommendations and potential solutions to these challenges. Um, and I think Linda just sent the link to, to our report that we published on our website today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celine, for pro providing this overview of the research. Um, as Celine mentioned, the um, link to the full report is um, in the chat box. We encourage all of you to go to our website and read the full report and the experiences um, that we found through the survey results and um, the focus groups, as well as the interviews with the clinicians. We will now um, take a short uh, five minute break. So please be back here um, in five minutes um, and we will hear from um, some additional colleagues about recommendations and actions to take forward, as well as from some of our members about the work they're already doing to improve diagnosis in their countries, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So we'll see you back here in five minutes. Now we will move into the second part of today's um, event. Um, so in the first hour, we heard um, stories from patients, experiences from doctors, and the survey findings from MPE. 
And this gives us a picture of the challenges that patients face in obtaining a timely diagnosis. And now we will move into the second part of the event where, we'll, where we will talk about some recommendations and solutions and hear from members about the work they're doing in their country. And now I'm excited to turn it over to my colleague, Kate Morgan, Head of Policy and Access at MPE, who will present the recommendations from our research and the MPE diagnosis pathway. Kate? Hi, everyone. Um, so as Katie said, I'm Kate Morgan, and I'm Head of Policy and Access here at MPE. And what I wanted to do um, for my presentation today was to go through the recommendations, actions, and next steps that we have generated as part of the research that Selene presented before the break. Next slide, please. So a core aim of the research was to really um, identify um, short and long-term solutions for MPE, uh, the wider patient community, um, doctors and nurses and other stakeholders to ensure that myeloma patients have a timely diagnosis. And you can see um, the list of 10 recommendations that we've generated as part of our research. I won't go through all of them today, but I think that um, you can categorize them broadly into four key areas. And firstly, um, and importantly for this um, presentation and for the work that MP is going to do over the, the coming years, is GP awareness and education, such as um, sort of di diagnosis aids um, and European and national referral guidelines were, were key themes that were generated from um, the interviews and um, literature reviews. Also, sort of more complex ways of um, predicting whether patients have myeloma through risk algorithms um, that could potentially be used in, um, in primary care. A second core theme is public health um, and campaigns to raise awareness, not of myeloma, because we don't want to, to scare people with, with specific symptoms, but thinking about how societies and uh, policymakers can promote um, patient attendance at GPs if their health changes and that people don't put off going there if they're worried about something. Thirdly, um, I think in, we've touched a lot about this in the presentations, but um, dialogue between different specialisms, so promoting dialogue between secondary and primary care, particularly if a patient has had a bad experience with diagnosis, and there may be some teachable moments or lessons that could be learned for, from that patient. Um, and other things are about promoting dialogue between uh, different departments and secondary care, because we heard a lot about patients turning Turning up at renal clinics or um, in orthopedics and then being sent back to primary care. Whereas I think um, if we promote um, more dialogue between different um, healthcare departments. And fourthly, um, po policy initiatives, and this is very important. So how do we promote generation of data on diagnosis times and, and access to diagnostic tests? not just in myeloma, but in all cancers, to make sure that appropriate initiatives are put in place to make sure that patients are diagnosed in time. There are a lot of um, discussions around cancer plans, and there's a European um, beating cancer plan. So how do we integrate um, the diag diagnosis strategies for rare and difficult to diagnose cancers within these? Because these are very important, and they, they steer the direction of countries across Europe. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, our next step, so a really central theme from all of the discussions that we had with patients and with doctors was the difficulty of GPs to, to recognize the signs and symptoms of myeloma because they're non-specific and myeloma is very rare. Um, compared to other cancers. Um, so reminding um, doctors about this um, is potentially an effective approach. And it's not the GP's fault that they're not diagnosed on time, and that's an important message. It's, it's very, very difficult that they have to be on top of a, lot, a wide range of diseases. So how do we um, reach them with information about myeloma to, to make their job a bit easier? 
A lot of the discussions that we had with people within the qualitative interviews and with doctors and patients was around um, effective awareness campaigns that are actually already in place across Europe in countries um, like Denmark and Poland, Croatia and the United Kingdom. And I think we need to make use of best practice in this, in this regard um, and roll that out across Europe. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, um, today we're really pleased to launch um, um, our European Myeloma Diagnosis Pathway. And this is our new MPE GP awareness campaign. And what we've done is um, we've created a diagnosis pathway that has been adapted um, from a Myeloma UK diagnosis pathway with their permission. And we've had this reviewed by our MPE a medical Advisory Committee, which involves um, myeloma experts from across Europe and updated it to make sure that it's um, applicable to, to all European countries. Our aim now is to disseminate this pathway and get it into the hands of as many GPs as possible over the coming years. And as, as well as disseminating it to GPs, we we plan to send it to the commission and to the commissioner um, in charge of the beating cancer plan. Um, so they're aware of the, the campaign that we're running. Next slide, please. Is, sorry, is there a slide missing? I think. Anyway, um, so in terms of, um, so I think there is a slide missing, but what I was going to say is what we really want um, to happen with the diagnosis pathway is to work with our members and um, patients and um, carers, industry to disseminate this within um, across Europe and within countries. So um, if an English pathway is acceptable to people, um, you could download it from the link that's displayed here and print it off and put it into the hands of your GP and encourage others to do the same. In addition, um, we would like to work with our members to potentially adapt um, this approach um, to be applicable within your country. So uh, we could sit down with you and come up with a plan to um, ask um, local healthcare professionals about the applicability in your country and how we tailor it um, to, to the best effect um, to make sure that, that um, it fits the diagnostic pathway within your country. And then we can work with you to translate it um, and print off hard copies um, for your constituents to give to your members. Um, other things that we can help you with um, are, as well as um, disseminating the pathway, we can help you with um, campaign materials such as press releases and writing to your um, writing to your local politicians and anything to raise awareness of the disease of myeloma in the campaign and and um, getting it um, into the hands of GPs to raise awareness. So, as I mentioned, you can download the pathway here. And if you'd like to be, in, if you're interested in working with us on this, uh, please just don't hesitate to get in contact with us at any point um, using the, um, the email address there, and we can sit down with you and come up with a plan. Um, next slide, please. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's the slide. So could you skip it to the next slide? Finally, um, so in terms of next steps, um, I think as, as well as um, in the short term raising awareness for the GPs, there's no quick fix for improving the diagnosis of myeloma. So we'll be continuing this um, over the coming years. Um, and our next uh, plan is to engage with European professional societies to discuss potentially developing um, a more sort of robust and specific learning module for GPs in collaboration with secondary care professionals and hematologists to make sure um, that it's as up to date and fit for purpose as possible. And this would, this would be aligned to CPD points, so there would be incentives for GPs to participate. And finally, and in the longer run, longer term, MP will work um, to explore the more innovative solutions through um, our evidence generation programs, such as developing um, risk algorithms or commissioning research to explore um, alternative ways of picking up um, myeloma in primary care. Um, and one final point, as, as well as the myeloma diagnosis pathway, which 
um, which you can download. Um, in the coming weeks, we are also creating an amyloidosis pathway, which people can download as well. And we're happy to work with people to, to, um, to adapt it and translate it as we are doing for the myeloma pathway. Um, so thank you very much for listening to the, into the research and hopefully um, we'll hear from you um, to, to work on the implementation of the pathway. Thank you so much, Kate, um, for presenting the pathway and how we can work with our members and the patient community on this. Um, so our next uh, presenters will be two MP members to talk about some of the programs that they have been running in their countries to help um, improve the time to diagnosis. Our first speaker is Olav Jasne, chairman of the Norwegian Blood Cancer Association. Olav? I love your unmute. So, should I start the video as well? And there we are. Would you like us to start the video first? Or no, did... no, not the video that you're going to show. I, I just wanted to give a short intro. Sure. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. I was, uh, I started by thanking for inviting me, thanking the speakers who have given a lot of good examples and emotional experiences. It's, it's always useful and very interesting to listen. And also facing that situation is not um, the same in all countries. It's uh, certainly a little bit different from country to country, what sort of challenges we are facing. And, uh, and uh, seeing the challenges we have seen is, um, is a common issue all over Europe in order to think how can we get the diagnose in place early as possible. This has to do with the satisfaction for people who are feeling unwell, having to go to doctors, testing, and never get a proper answer to the moment of starting treatment. Um, my experience in a multiple myeloma in Norway is the biggest group of blood cancer uh, patients that they experience when they finally get their clear answer that your diagnosis is multiple myeloma, treatment is going very good. But up to that moment, it's a lot of, a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges, questions, going to doctors, going to new doctors, going to get answers, and uncertainty what are the reasons for the symptoms that we are facing? And uh, we started in Norway to discuss this with the National Medical Association. That's the association of all medical doctors in the, in the country. And they have a specific team, a specific group with employees working only with the GPs. And GPs is, as I think, uh, it was Dr. Paulin who said that patients uh, and GPs um, usually see maximum one or two and multiple myeloma patients and diagnose them throughout their career. I think that's correct. It's brought me to say to doctors that if you ever are so happy from the doctor's side that you manage to meet a multiple myeloma patient, you should celebrate. The point is they're not prepared for what really to look for. The important thing is that there are a lot of similarities between some leukemias and, um, and uh, multiple myeloma. So doctors should be aware and they should get on the track very quick. And this is what we have discussed with the medical association. And uh, we have agreed. Uh, fairly light program we face that doctors are receiving so much information so much material so much questions that uh, a small complex multiple myeloma is complex not only as a disease but also as a very small diagnose group and that's what we have to face 
uh, and they, it's not first on their mind. We also discussed it with the universities and university doctors, if we should have more emphasized, more focus on this during education. And we have been advised that this is not really what they're aiming for. The conclusion we made together with the medical association is that we simply are going to make some um, films, short three minute stories that can be used at all their meetings locally and centrally, films that's raising their awareness. And um, what I want to do, we are just in the, in, in the phase of, launch, of um, finalizing the films. I will show you a film. It's a little bit in Norwegian, but it's good with some linguistic challenges as well. And um, it's uh, only, say, 30, 40 seconds into the film. I like you to see how we approach it. It's a patient. There will be an intro by the medical doctor. And with that, it's um, just showing what sort of thinking we have around the films. This. Yeah, I suggest you just start with the film. I don't know if you hear me now, but it's the long hunt for a dangerous diagnosis. Jag fick denna diagnosen i januar 2018. Då hade jag gått ganska lång tid med lite uspecifika symptomer på att något var galt i kroppen min. En liten backe och jag blev ampusten och upptrappa ampusten. Jag har för det levt ett aktivt liv. Jag har drivit med hundesport och i det helt tatt hållt mig fysiskt aktiv. Så efter lite tid så uppsökte jag lägen och vi startade ett löp för att försöka finna ut av vad detta handlade om. Jag blev sent många olika städer i starten för jag hade lite litt rare verdier når det gjaldt lever. Så jeg ble sendt til en kontroll av lever uten at de fant noe veldig vesentlig annerledes der. Ok. Jeg hadde også en del svimmelhetsanfall. Ja. This is the idea that we are working on. That we bringing up patients, telling their story, and she started telling that she started feeling exhausted, fatigued. She was active in sport with her dogs, and she was starting a round trip to be seen by a lot of doctors. Meet doctors, and new doctors, new information, but nobody got to the point that what she could have. And I think that's an, a common experience from what we are receiving from our members. It takes a long time to be diagnosed properly. And with these films, we will, we will create films for all type of blood cancer over time. But um, films will be available then to be shared and used in common activities for all the medical doctors. It will, of course, be available online. It will be available online on their websites and it will pop up because the answer is actually very simple. The answer is if you are uncertain, if you think you could potentially have a patient in front of you that has a multiple myeloma diagnosis, make the extended blood um, um, the blood test. Soon as you make the extended blood test, I call it extended to simplify a little bit, but you don't need to have a specified, detailed multiple myeloma test. You can do a screening test and you will have an answer that you need to work further with this patient and the patient should immediately be sent over to an hematologist. That's the only answer and the only suggestions we have to the doctors. I yesterday spoke uh, with uh, one of the GPs about it, and she said, it's not very common, it's in her mind not to do any mistakes, but it's so difficult with symptoms of multiple myeloma because it could be a lot of other uh, issues. But uh, push to take a thorough blood test whenever you are uncertain, is the conclusion on all the films that we are sending out in the time to come. 
I think basically that's the main initiative we have. We are not doing anything of written material. We have written material available for patients, for doctors. We have seminars. We have a lot of sessions of activities, but it seems that talking to a lot of GPs and talking to their association, these small film clips is the reminder that they should be given. So that program is started and I hope it's gonna work so we get more medical doctors to take a quick initiative. It's important to have the diagnosis in place very quick. That's basically from Norway. And the pictures you saw, the film you saw was not from Oslo. Snow has started coming, but not yet here. Thank you so much, Olav, for sharing the work that you are doing in Norway. Um, and I'm excited to announce our next speaker, uh, Mira Amor, patient advocate, co-founder and CEO of Myeloma Croatia. Mira? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon, it, and thank you very much for asking me to share our Croatian experience and our Croatian story. I think the previous speakers, patients and doctors and all of now, I think uh, we all share the same thread. Um, and um, I will share with you what we did about our um, uh, in Croatia. One of the slogans we developed through the last five years was uh, what you see now, and that's basically about multiple myeloma, it's early diagnosis, better prognosis. So can I have the first slide, please? So um, we have mani managed in last uh, four years, five years, uh, to go from uh, 230 new diagnoses in a year to the latest information from our insurance fund is 330 di diagnoses a year. Um, the slogan we had is uh, Rana Diagnosa Bolja Prognosa, so early diagnosis, better prognosis, and that goes through everything we do now uh, in raising awareness. We did it in three stages, which I'll share with you. And first one is to understand the Croatian multiple myeloma environment where they live, work and get treatment. The second one is uh, to share some of our campaigns and activities in, since 2018 on raising awareness. And the third one is really to share how we got how we get got on with our project of early diagnosis, which we started in September two, uh, 2020. Next slide. So understanding the creation multiple pyeloma environment. So our Hrvatski Zavod za Jadnovno Zdravstvo, so that's Croatian Insurance Fund, publishes information on incidence, prevalence, mortality. And when we first uh, um, set off about it, we have, um, okay, <laughs> you're going ahead. Okay, so when we set out about it, we had about, uh, you can see it 2016, it changes, but it was going in between, I don't know, 200 in 2009 to 264 in 2016. But uh, what we were looking at is uh, what is important for our patients, um, and that is uh, that uh, the access to new drugs was very delayed at the time where, when myeloma Croatia started, um, um, was founded, we were almost 10 years behind with uh, approvals and reimbursement on the basic myeloma drugs like uh, bortezomib, lenalidomide and thalidomide. So in the period from 2014 to 19, we had great advances and we got bortezomib in the first line, which was really very, very late in the life of the drug. Lenalidomide in the second line, then plus, but malidomide in third, and now we've got carfilzomib, ixazomib, and dara since 2019. So in myeloma, we know that it's important to get access to drugs, 
um, the difficulty is once you get to a relapse and refractory stage, you have a problem. So next point, please. And the other thing which we have in Croatia, uh, which is a small country with good treatment, actually, we had good access now relative to many countries in Europe. It's, we don't have clinical trials. And the late, last one we had registered was in 2015, and which was for daratumumab. Sadly, we didn't have any patients enrolled. We had one or two enrolled. And that was at the time we, when we didn't even have the other, the second generation of novel drugs. So the, the other problem, next one, please. The other really huge problem for small countries and uh, I think Eastern European countries and Southern European countries is that we have uh, very few pharma companies present in the country. Uh, very few gen uh, genetics companies are not interested in our countries. Uh, and if you go further down away from Croatia, Croatia is in EU, EU so we are sort of okay. Uh, you have no presence of some of the pharma companies, so you have no presence, you, you can't get even the basic essential myeloma drugs. So this was why, what was the reality? Next slide, please. Uh, so what we uh, thought is, okay, we we will work on access really diligently, but what we need to do is look at the other thing which is important for the outcome in multiple myeloma uh, patients, uh, um, quality of life, uh, the length of life and things, and that's the, uh, the uh, fact that early diagnosis the, is the other factor which is very important for the outcome. So since um, uh, next bullet. So since uh, March 2018, we started um, a campaign, uh, which is a monthly long campaign on awareness. The first one was called One Name, 750 Stories. We heard two stories still day, one from Luke and the other one from Severin. We can see every single story is different. Next point, please. So we thought of doing uh, the sort of usual, you do the infographics, you do lots of Facebook uh, sort of and media, social media presence. Uh, we have carried on with this one name, which is one name is multiple myeloma, 750 stories. In 2018, we had 750 patients alive in Croatia. We estimated that we had 750 patients in Croatia. Um, and we started collecting their stories. Uh, next point, please. And uh, one of the stories is... Uh, Yelena's and her husband um, Ivan, who was 43, and by fluke, he uh, was diagnosed uh, with multiple myeloma after having a terrible backache. Uh, Yelena was pregnant with the second baby at that time, and it, the story was really quite bad. Luckily, he was diagnosed. Um, so that was one of our stories. We have lots of stories on our uh, web page. Next uh, point, please. And uh, then we created this slogan, uh, early diagnosis, um, early diagnosis, better prognosis. Next slide, please. So uh, next point. Uh, so in apart from having activities during the March, which is Multiple Myeloma Awareness Month, we also every last Thursday in March, we have declared uh, it. We have declared it with some international other other associations, patients associations, as a multiple myeloma global myeloma day, and we have actually uh, started campaigns. Our campaigns, you can see them uh, there, uh, either panels or various campaigns on awareness. They they have names like uh, one name, 750 stories or, uh, or early diagnosis. And then as we go to 2020, 21, we started a new project on early diagnosis. Next slide, please. 
And we have ensured that every March on the last Thursday in the month, uh, we have a huge present in the media. So we have press releases, we have our doctors and our patient organization present on TV, radio, shows in media, a lot of uh, newspaper articles. Uh, we have started, uh, so we have launched uh, we have launched uh, our next project in March, which was uh, the Croatian diagnostic pathway. So next slide. Uh, this is a multi-holder project and uh, it was divided in three stages. So we took time. We started in September, 2020. At the first stage, the second stage was in uh, then from September to December 2020, and then the last one, uh, the third one of the first part of this project, because it's a long-term project, it's not going to stop now, because every year we have new patients, unfortunately, and we want to catch them early. So uh, from, um, next slide, please. Uh, so in the first uh, stage of this project, we have organized a virtual meeting. Um, and next bullet point, please. Uh, so this meeting was uh, online because of COVID. And we have ensured that we have presence from all uh, uh, professional people who would be possibly important in the uh, in the um, ensuring that the early diagnosis is uh, happened on time. So multiple stakeholders in our case were next point please, um, and the next one. Maybe you can show all of them at the same time. So we had multiple stakeholders. We were looking at the problem we had, and we were also looking, uh, we uh, presented various examples that we came across early diagnosis in Europe. And one of them was also Myeloma UK uh, diagnostic pathway, uh, which we also looked at and then adopted in a way, not adopted by but um, adopted it to our creation uh, reality. Of course, we, we have asked for permission from Myeloma UK in this. So next, um, so I'll, uh, in the second, uh, so at that meeting, we decided we have to have everyone involved who's important. So we had our organization, which is Myeloma Croatia. We had patients and carers. We shared the story. Uh, we had two professional associations of hematologists. We, in Croatia, we have uh, um, Hrvatsko, uh, Croatian Association of Hematologists, and then specifically Cooperative of Croatian Hematologists. We worked with both of those. And what was good with both, uh, we worked with the um, family uh, doctors and their association, a radiologist and Croatian Institute of Public Health. So we have 20 uh, people involved in this process. Next slide, please. Um, and we have decided to create um, a leaflet and a handout. And I agree with Olaf that the GPs are very burdened with millions of diseases and millions of diagnoses. But we thought the first step is for us to create something we can hand out at the congresses and meetings. And this is our version of the uh, diagnostic pathway. We changed the name. If you look at this RAKK, basically that's crab, but in Croatian. And it's very fortunate because RAK in Croatian is also a crab, the little creature. So um, we have changed some of the things because some of the diagnostic things were not available in Croatia. I won't go over the what is important for myeloma. We know what are the main um, the main uh, difficulties in diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Next slide. So uh, once we got this is the first stage. So having diagnostic pathway was the first 
a thing we've done, but then we needed to uh, spread the word and we've decided to do it like uh, reach everyone who can do anything regarding recognizing, confirming and treating the disease. So the first year after the March 21, when we have the, the Awareness Day and media campaign on the last Thursday in March, we have also had a presentation at the Congress of Family Doctors uh, with the RAC or Diagnostic Pathway, as we call it. And also you have a link here, which maybe when anyone who is interested can, can have a look at, but basically there is a, a monthly uh, publication of physicians, all physicians in Croatia. There is about 10,000 physicians who are members of this uh, association. So we included the uh, leaflet on a hard board in this uh, publication. Uh, so we were present also with handouts and now we are on the next stage of this project and that is to look at diagnostics because diagnostics are a huge difficulty in diagnosing, diagnosing myeloma properly. Um, there are simple diagnostic tests like sedimentation, um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is cheap and it's very available. And next slide is a picture of all of us on one of our campaigns for access, very successful one with our physicians here. Uh, we are very happy to share and take part in this because we feel that early diagnosis is something we can possibly do something impactful whilst the access seems to be very difficult um, uh, work which we need to carry on doing, but it seems to give re results much slower. So thank you very much for your time and including me in this. Thank you so much, Mira and Olav, for sharing the um, impressive work that you're doing in your countries. Um, we know that these are having a big impact for your community, and we hope that they will um, inspire um, other member organizations and that you can continue to be a resource for the patient community. So we have um, not too much time for questions, but we will um, open up for questions. So my first question is um, for both Dr. Pollan and Dr. Karen Filski. How can we facilitate the collaboration across um, specialists in order to schedule complementary assess assessments quicker um, in parallel and not one after one? Um, Dr. Karen Filski, would you like to begin? I give it ladies first, but anyway. Oh, okay. I uh, saw you first we, on my Zoom. <laughs> we, we do have cooperation. It's it's not something that, that should be a question. I mean, whenever we have a look at look at it from this side. I, I am a hematologist. I do get a patient at least with a reasonable suspicion having myeloma. So uh, if I need an orthopedist to do some corrections, or if I need a radiologist to do some radiotherapy, or if I need a psychologist to maybe uh, prevent any uh, setbacks on, on behalf of the patient, I can call them whenever uh, I need to. But it is not a chain of, of things that go one after another. The condition of the patient directs me to which help I need or the patient needs. So it's readily available. It's not, it's not that. The question is how to jump through the channel of many specialists seeing the patient before the diagnosis. This is the problem. Once we have the reasonable suspicion, we have all, co all collaboration. Thanks. And Dr. Pollan? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the question is how to try and coordinate some of those initial visits between different specialists, perhaps when the diagnosis is still uncertain. And I guess the answer will be slightly different in different healthcare systems. So it will depend whether there's people are all in the same hospital or some in the community, perhaps some in a different hospital. I know there are efforts in the UK to try and link up hospital information systems between um, different hospitals and the, indeed in, back to the community as well, so that you can access, for example, imaging reports. You know, it, a lot of patients say to me, oh, well, I, of course you could, must be able to see a report of a test I had in a different hospital, but actually that's not always the case if those things are not linked together or kind of actively sought, out after, sought after. So I think some of these things are kind of, 
um, systems based and more kind of problems with the healthcare system and how it's set up and um, but pushing for, for those things to be more joined up um, from from our end to try and make sure that that is fixed would um, potentially save investigations and patients having to repeat things. Great, thanks. Um, so, so our next question is is kind of to everyone, um, both the patients, the hematologists, and the members. Um, we heard a lot about fatigue um, today as a major symptom to um, to getting the diagnosis. Is there um, do you have any thoughts on how we can help potential patients take fatigue more seriously in terms of going to their GP or GPs or specialists understanding this what fatigue might mean for a patient and then taking the proper next steps, um, if anyone wants to jump in. Severine, Luke, either of the hematologists? Yeah, I can, I can do it again, but it, it, it's, not, it's not an easy question. Mm -hmm. Fatigue is something that is not specific to anything. I mean, you can be, because it's, uh, you're mentally exhausted, you can feel fatigue. If you have a serious disease, you can feel uh, fatigue. So it's not a directing symptom. It's not a directing manifestation. It's simply telling you something is wrong with me. So seeing your general physician should be an obligation once you feel that something is not right. It was the same thing with COVID. You just feel that something is not right with you. You don't know it's COVID until you are tested, but mm -hmm. it was something. Yeah. Severine. Yeah. Um, what I, I fully agree with you, Oliver, on, on, on your response. What I was feeling when I went to my GP, as I mentioned during my presentation, honestly, I was never sick or almost never, lucky me. And um, what I found is sometimes they are not taking you or they were not taking me seriously. When I was saying that I, I was really suffering fatigue and so on, even though I, I again, I understand fatigue can, <laughs> can be everything and nothing. So this, I, I do agree. But the, the seriousness of, of my talk was not well perceived, I would say. This, this was, it was really how I felt when I was seeing some of the GP. So perhaps it's also due to the French way of doing things because we can go um, and see whomever we want almost. Um, I do have a family GP, so he, he, he was seeing me every time I had to. So he knew how I was behaving and so on, but he didn't really um, interpret it fairly what I was telling him. That was a point, honestly speaking, but I understand it's difficult. Severin, I totally understand you, but there is a certain sentence that I tell people uh, out, outside of professional circles. The public perceives us as superhumans very often. What we know professionally is a result of our learning and mm -hmm. upgrading mm -hmm. our yeah. knowledge. But how we behave towards uh, toward other people is something that we got from our mothers and fathers. Mm -hmm. Person and behaving and uh, relation to people is something that is inside the human nature. It's not a professional issue. Mm -hmm. Good point. Luke? I, uh, I can only agree with Severin and Dr. Uh, fatigue on its own is never, will never be a symptom that will uh, give a diagnosis. It will just, is, in case it is related to other symptoms which indicates the diagnosis of myeloma, it will be recognized as, as such, but never as on its own. In my case, I, I I felt all the period the fatigue, and I had to drag sometimes myself. But I continue my normal life. So mm -hmm. who who even myself, I wasn't aware that something deeper or more serious was uh, involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Katie, Thanks. you have a question about a uh, uh, screening mm -hmm. test. Yes, there was a question earlier. Um, I think. A few of you mentioned um, the potential for screening tests, um, Charlotte or, or 
Dr. Karamfilski, if you'd like to elaborate. I know Shreva, that was in part of your presentation. I will never recommend that every patient that enters a GP's office has this analysis, but mm -hmm. GPs should have access to this. In my country, they don't. They have access to sedimentation rate, uh, blood count, uh, renal function, some enzymes, uh, liver enzymes, serum iron. I believe I covered it, just basic tests. So if there is reasonable doubt in the language of, of, of uh, advocates, then they should be able to use this. If you mm -hmm. find hyperproteinemia, high level of seroproteins, and especially high level of gamma globulins, even before you diagnose what class is it, or is it one class or two classes, it is a directional finding towards myeloma. The hematologist will, uh, will get rid of the necessary, unnecessary results. Yeah, I was just going to add there are a couple of studies looking at whether or not screening more broadly would be helpful. Um, so one is a, a study being carried out in Iceland where they're screening the whole population essentially for um, MGUS initially and, and but essentially for, for myeloma. So the patients know they have MGUS and can then be monitored more closely for, for, general, for development of myeloma. But at, at the moment, we don't have the outcome from that. So the question is whether or not you... Um, unnecessarily alarm patients or unne lead to unnecessary intervention for patients who do not require it by doing something like that on that kind of scale. Mm -hmm. And so at the moment, as um, Dr. Karen Falski said, you know, targeting uh, di diagnostic tests towards patients in whom there is a suspicion of myeloma is what I think most hematologists would agree is, is the right approach rather than the kind of blanket approach. There's an interesting study in the US looking at um, screening in just higher risk populations. So um, patients of uh, black ethnicity, for example, um, to try and see whether that kind of targeted screening would be um, appropriate. But again, we don't have the results of that yet. Thanks. And unfortunately, um, the question and answer session was not long enough for us. I know there's a lot of questions that we didn't get to, but in our follow-up today with the links to all the information and the recording, we will try to um, provide answers to all of the questions in writing, and we've taken everything down. So um, in order to, to be respectful of everyone's time, um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone for joining us today. This would not have been a successful event without all of your participation, and a special thanks to all of our presenters. Um, for sharing their experiences and perspectives today. Just a few things before we close. MP has a wide range of communication assets, um, many of which are available in all of the member languages in Europe. You can find um, links to these in the chat box. Please go to our website to download the infographics, um, check out the videos and the other things from European Myeloma Day. If you have any questions about MP or the work that we do, please get in touch with us um, at info at mpeurope.org. And if you're interested in getting more involved in the work that we do or receiving updates about our events, um, please fill out the get involved form in the, um, the link is in the chat box as well. And if you're particularly interested in supporting our research projects, like the ones that you, um, the, the ones that you heard about today, we have several research projects ongoing and we continue to um, launch new projects to answer the most pressing uh, questions for the patient community. So you can see um, we have uh, some projects on shared decision making, CAR T cell therapy and AL amyloidosis. So you can find out more about those on our website or through the link. And um, of course, please go to our website to read the full um, research report, download the diagnosis pathway, get in touch with us if you want to learn how it can be adapted for your country and how we can work together. And as I mentioned, we'll send all of this out by email in case you've missed anything in the chat. And just a huge thanks again for your participation and involvement um, today. We, we couldn't do this without you. And um, this is really just the beginning of our collective efforts to help improve the lives of those affected by myeloma. We hope today gave you some inspiration and motivation and most importantly, some actionable next steps that we can take as a community. Thank you so much for being here and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.